to take on human flesh so that he could go to the cross and die for our sins. We thank you, Lord, for victorious resurrection from the dead. We thank you for the result of that, the fact that our sins are paid and Christ is alive, that we can have eternal life through faith in your Son. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And truly, it's authoritative, it's infallible, it's inerrant. And as we take a look at the book of Genesis, I pray that we might have a clear understanding of your precious word and that you might continue to help us to grow in your grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to him be all praise, honor, and glory in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, let's uh, begin with Genesis chapter 9. We're continuing... Uh, just a chapter by chapter survey of the book of Genesis. I don't know if I'm going to do that with every book of the Bible. <laughs> We'd be here for a while, but I think Genesis is so foundational. Uh, it's essential that we take a closer look at uh, the book of Genesis. Eventually, I, I'm, I think, and I might do this on Wednesday night after we finish our series on Bible prophecy, to go through uh, the book of Genesis verse by verse. So that's down the road, but uh, right now we're just hitting the high points uh, in the book of Genesis, and I just want to start out with Genesis 9, 13. After the flood of Noah, God set his rainbow in the cloud. Notice this. And uh, verse 13 says, I, I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the purpose of the rainbow is a reminder of God's promise. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. He didn't say there will never be floods again, but there will never be a universal flood to destroy all flesh. And we know that one day the earth will be destroyed by fire. Uh, in Second Peter, but here, this is God's promise of uh, the reminder of He will never again destroy all flesh. Now, I want to start with this uh, slide here. You remember this picture? You probably saw a few weeks ago, uh, about actually about a month ago. A storm came through this area, and we had a complete rainbow. So I took a picture of it. But that's not the end of the story. <laughs> I have this second rainbow. Within a month, I saw a second rainbow. I was over at James and Lee's house, and we were looking out the window. <laughs> and I said, there's a rainbow out there. And so I went out, and I took a picture, and another full rainbow within a month. That has never happened in my lifetime to see two full rainbows within a space of a month. So once again, a reminder of God's faithfulness and promises. So let's go on into chapter 10. Chapter 10, we have the table, what we call the table of nations. Uh, we have 70 different individuals or peoples or nations mentioned in chapter 10, 70. Uh, and we have Noah's three sons now repopulate the earth after the flood. In verse 1, we have the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then sons were born to them after the flood. And then we have this chapter organized by the sons of Japheth first in verse 2. And then notice in verse 6, the sons of Ham. Verse 6, the sons of Ham. And then we finally get to the descendants of what would be the uh, children of Abraham eventually. Uh, the descendants there of uh, Shem. And that, which verse is that here? Got sons of Shem. Uh, in, I just had it here. Uh, verse 22. Verse 22, sons of Shem. Um, now, a couple observations about this chapter here. When we look at some of these nations, and I, we're not going to go through all of these different names, but these nations are essential because later on in Israel's history, Israel will deal with a lot of these nations. And, and so we're reminded of 
their origin uh, early on in Genesis chapter 10. And starting out with the sons of Japheth, I highlighted a few names uh, in blue. We have in verse 2, Magog. And that's very familiar because if you look at Ezekiel, we have several names that are mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. These will be enemies of the children of Israel in the future, in the future tribulation period. We have Magog, Magog verse 2, Tubal, Meshech, Gomer, verse 3, and Togarmah. And those individual names are mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. And so let's just take a look at Ezekiel 38. Notice in Ezekiel 38, verse 2, Son of man, set your face against Gog, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. And I believe Rosh is Russia. Russia. Many scholars believe that that is Russia. And, of course, Russia will play a role in organizing nations after the rapture. Of course, this is not fulfilled today. But we do see the rise of Russia, I think, as a precursor to the fulfillment of these events. Um, Meshech, Tubal, and many of these countries are located in Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And then other nations will join them, including uh, Ethiopia, Libya, and so forth. And then uh, we have here uh, Togarma in verse 6. So the nations mentioned here in Genesis 10 are mentioned later in the Bible. Now, notice the repeated phrase, after each descendant of Noah, we have this statement here, a similar phrase, verse 5, from these the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands. Everyone according to his language, according to their families and their nations. So we have mentioned languages, um, and this is a little bit out of chronological order, Genesis is... Uh, chronological in general, but thematic as well. And so the uh, we'll see in the following chapter when the nations divided, when, when did languages begin. And so this assumes that fact uh, already that uh, the world is divided into various nations and also languages. So we have the repeated phrase here in verse 5, and then we have the sons of Ham in verse 6. And then we have the uh, verse 20, this phrase, these were the sons of Ham according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. And the same with the Shemites, uh, beginning in verse 21. And we have at the end, Verse uh, 31, these are the sons of Shem according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, and according to their nations. Their nations. And then finally, a summary statement in verse 32, these were the families of the sons of Noah according to their generations and their nations, and from these the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. God told Noah to scatter, uh, but uh, they did not listen, and this sets us up for the Tower of Babel. But before we look at that account in the following chapter, a couple more observations in this chapter of certain nations that are familiar later in Israel's history. If we go back here uh, to the sons of Ham, for instance, uh, we have the Canaanites. You remember in the days of Joshua, the Canaanites were the enemies of the children of Israel. So those were the descendants of Ham. And therefore, we also have the other enemies that later on were enemies of Israel. It's interesting, we have a state statement here uh, in verse 8 that Cush begot Nimrod. And he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. But he started a couple godless civilizations, including Babel. Notice that, and this leads us to the Tower of Babel. Nimrod was the leader uh, who organized that, I believe, in, in the following chapter. Uh, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Babel. We get the Babylonians later in Israel's history. If you re recall the Old Testament, how... 
Later on, uh, in the days of Saul, David and Solomon, Israel, were, they were under a united king. We call that the United Kingdom. Uh, Saul reigned for 40 years, David 40, and Solomon 40 as well. And then the kingdom split uh, into the north and the south, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Israel became a name known for the northern kingdom, and then the southern kingdom was Judah. And Israel was godless. They set up pagan worship outside of Jerusalem. And so they drew their boundaries north of Jerusalem. And therefore, they set up two pagan worship centers. And the kings of the northern kingdom were only evil. And eventually, it was the Assyrians who captured the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. And then the southern kingdom continued along for a while until... 586 B.C. And then the Babylonians captured the southern kingdom. So we have those two enemies later on in Israel's history that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. The Babylonians, and notice here we have uh, Nimrod also uh, built uh, here uh, Assyria. From that land he went to Assyria. And he built Nineveh. Now, who went to Nineveh and preached a message of judgment? Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and we have the story of Jonah. The story of Jonah. So we have an introduction here, and I think a lot of these names will later show up in Israel's history, and so it's important to highlight uh, some of these influential nations and know the origins of these various nations. We have the Philistines uh, mentioned. Notice in verse 14, uh, we have them mentioned there. Now, I have a little note here about Mizraim in verse 14, basically transliterating the Hebrew word for Egypt. These are the Egyptians in verse 13. So Mizraim are the Egyptians. They are also the enemies of the children of Israel there. Now, Let's take a look at a couple more names in verse 23. The sons of Aram. Now, eventually, Abraham was an Armenian, or Aramean, Aramean. And Laban and Jacob are both called Arameans. And therefore, Abraham came from the sons of Aram. And then notice Uz. Job lived in the land of Uz. The introduction to the book of Job. He lived in the land of Uz. And we have other names here uh, mentioned that are important. Now, verse 25, we have an event that happened. To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Now, what does that mean, the earth was divided? Now, you can have a physical division of the earth, some would say, but I believe this was the division of languages. So the Tower of Babel incident in the following chapter occurred here in verse 25. This is the time when the Tower of Babel occurred and the earth was divided into various people groups and language, languages, really languages at this point. All right, we have the, inter, the, the beginning then of nationalism. And when we studied earlier in the prior chapter, the basis for nationalism is men judging men. And one of the key elements in that, showing that nation, uh, people judging people as a prevention for evil spreading upon all the human race is found in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, notice by man shall his blood be shed. So the beginning of human government the beginning of human government. Remember, before the flood, the, we have one world, everyone was speaking the same language, and what happened? Corruption, corruption. And therefore, as a basis of uh, preventing evil, we have a capital punishment established, and that continues till this day, and will continue all the way through world history. Uh, Romans 13 reminds us that the magistrate does not bear the sword in vain and we are to submit to those in authority. 
But God established human government for the preservation of the human race. And when one evil, evil nation arises to power, other righteous nations can judge that ungodly nation. And that's why we had to put a stop in World War II to Hitler. Uh, you know, and God used various coalitions of nations to do that. So this is for the preservation. God established separate nations for the preservation of man. And that's the opposite thinking today. The basic premise of internationalism today is man is good. So if I go to the terrorists and sit down with the terrorists and say, you know, you know, we're going to take care of you. We're going to give you a lot of money. We're going to try to make a peace tree with you. Let's just talk about it. You know, that he'll automatically warm up to us and say, okay, all right, no problem. You think that'll work? <laughs> try that with Putin. Uh, no, tyrants are tyrants and they must be stopped. Uh, basically, we understand scripture. We have a biblical perspective, God's perspective. Man is basically evil. Man is basically evil. The heart is desperately wicked, as Jeremiah puts it. Who can know it? So this premise that man is basically good and all we need to do is put that man in the right environment, you know, provide things for that individual and he'll turn out good, is faulty. It's false. It's false. Um, so here, uh, capital punishment was given as a deterrent for those who commit capital crimes. I remember teaching this years ago, and uh, there was a lawyer in the class, and he said, well, you know, there's due process. I said, certainly there's due process. Even in the nation of Israel, there was due process. Uh, or, or, you know, we don't take the uh, law into our own hands, but after the due process and trial by jury, we had the right to execute murderers, and uh, the Bible is clear on this. So this is a, some, something that was implemented before the Mosaic Law and continues throughout the church age, capital punishment. What's the reason for that? Well, you took a life. Notice who is emphasized here. Not the criminal, but the victim. That individual blood that was shed, you took someone who was made in God's image. Notice that. He is, for in the image of God, he made man. You took a life that was made in God's image. Therefore, you deserve death. You deserve death. And notice they were to repopulate the earth in verse 7, be fruitful, multiply, as originally given, this mandate was given to uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. So, we have here the promise of never destroying the earth again. Then we have the various nations established in chapter 10. Now, let's move on into chapter 11. Chapter 11. And again, this, again, understanding the, the uh, chapter 10, we step back a bit where the whole earth was had one language. So before the days of Peleg, when the earth was divided into languages, here we have this incident called the Tower of Babel. Now the whole, whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Now Shinar is in, introduced in the prior chapter, the region of Babylon. Shinar is sometimes used as another name for Babylon. And they dwelt there. And I think I have a map of the land of Shinar. Yeah, the plain of Shinar right here. So in this map, let's see if I can zoom in on it a little bit. Um, and we'll show you this region. So this is the area of Babylon, the Tigris Euphrates River. Um, and we have Babel here, or Babylon, and then the area, the plain of Shinar. And then Ur is where Abraham left. We'll see that, uh, again, it sets us up for where Ur left out of that region and went to the Promised Land. So that's the area of Shinar. We call that the Fertile Crescent in that area near the Persian Gulf region. So this is the area of Babel. And verse 3, they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for stone, they had asphalt for mortar. 
And notice, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. And notice this is in defiance to God. Lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. See, they're doing this in direct rebellion against God's command to scatter. God told them to scatter after the flood. And they said, nope, we're not going to do that. We are the world. <laughs> and therefore, we're going to come together and build the first United Nations building. And uh, more than likely, these ziggurats in, in uh, those days were built to worship the stars and uh, various deities, pagan worship. And therefore, the idea is not only is it a city, but it's a system of religious rebellion against God. And it's interesting, we trace Babylon throughout the entire word of God. We end up in the book of Revelation where Babylon is revived. And one world religion comes back into play. And we're, by the way, headed down that road. Not only one world government, but we're headed toward one world religious system. And eventually that will be under the Antichrist. But if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be raptured before that begins. So you'll be in heaven when that occurs. But our world is moving toward one world religion. You think, that, well, that's a good thing. You know, let's just tear down our denominational walls and hold hands and sing Kumbaya and everything will be okay. And no, Paul was adamant against those who preach another gospel. He said, let them be anathema, cursed. There are other religions that don't believe in faith alone and Christ alone. They believe in some kind of works salvation, and that is against what God's word reveals. And we're not to join hand in hand with godless pagan religion. You don't have to be worshiping an idol to be worshiping something that's pagan. Understand that. You don't have to be bowing down to some idol. You know, we have religion in America, and it's man's way of earning salvation instead of God's provided way through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the first not only world uh, meeting together and building a city, but also a system that is in opposition to God. And notice how the attitude is mentioned here. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. We have anthropomorphic language here. Mm -hmm. The Lord obviously knows all things, but he's speaking baby talk so that we'll understand that God is aware of what's happening. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one. Notice, we are one. Mm -hmm. And they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them meaning that we're headed toward the same situation we had before the flood. The pervasive, rapid spread of evil. We don't want that repeated. And God's being just here. He's actually being merciful. God's being merciful here. See, we look at God as some kind of tyrant and bully pushing people around. But God's being merciful. He wants the whole human race to be preserved so that they have an opportunity to believe in the gospel. And, uh, and they can have freedom too. Now, so he says, you know what? There's nothing that they intend to do that will stop them. And therefore, as a preventative uh, and a breaking up of this world uh, movement, he said, let us go down in verse seven and confuse our language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And I can't speak, I mean, I've learned a little bit of Spanish, a little bit of Spanish, um, um, and a and, uh, couple languages, but uh, I can't speak <laughs> those languages. I have hard enough time with English. But um, I can imagine someone there speaking German and pass a hammer and someone speaking French, and what are you talking about? What do you mean? Go over there and get this uh, brick over here. No, what, what are you talking about? I can't understand you. And so uh, there's much confusion there. And notice the Lord scattered them, in verse 8, from over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, Babel. And it sounds like Babel, you know, Bob, Bob, Babel, like baby talk. You know, babies 
They say ba ba ba, ma ma ma. Sometimes da da. <laughs> but uh, the name is called Babel. It's onomatopoetic. Uh, the the name uh, because there it was the Lord confounded the language. He confused the language and he scattered them abroad. Now in chapter ten we are narrowed down to the line of Shem. And this is important because it sets up, sets us up for the story of Abraham or Abram. Uh, the Shemites, of course, their line led to the descendant of Abram. Notice Peleg is mentioned in verse 16, by the way. We have Peleg mentioned in verse 16 of uh, this chapter 11. And then we have those descendants, and we go down eventually into onto uh, Abram's grandfather, Terah, uh, or father here. He begot Terah. Nahor lived 119 years, begot sons and daughters. And Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram. Abram. So here we have Terah's descendants in verse 27. And notice... Uh, eventually, we have the, the lot that's mentioned there in verse 27, Abram's nephew. Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur the Chaldees. And then, verse 31, Terah took his son Abram and his, his grandson Lot, the descendants of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his sons, Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur the Chaldees, Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Now the reason why they left Ur is mentioned in the following chapter. God made an unconditional promise to Abram and his descendants. We call this the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. So I do have a map here of where Ur is and Haran we have here the land of Ur, as we saw in the Fertile Crescent. And uh, let's take a closer look here of this region. And this region of Ur, next to the Persian, what modern-day Persian Gulf. But uh, Ur is here, and Abraham left, went by Babylon, and then went up to Haran, which is this northern region. He waited for his father to die. Some say that was a lack of faith on Abram's part, that delay, but we won't get into that, but he eventually waited till his father died and the plan of God continued. He went down to the land of Canaan and this is the promised land. So he went down in this region here, we would call this region the modern day Israel. So God took him from that area uh, and that background area of course is where we have that pagan religion and religious system Babel in that region. And it's interesting, later he described uh, the grandfather that he was involved in pagan religions. I think that's an ax. Uh, the idea of uh, Abram left a pagan religious system to worship the one true God. God revealed himself as one God. And uh, therefore, he now is worshiping the one true God. So what is God doing now in Genesis? Well, we already saw the result of after creation, we had the fall of man, we had the flood, we have man uh, rebelling against God, and God is dealing basically with the Gentile nations. And God says, you know what? I'm gonna establish my program through one nation now. I'm gonna narrow my focus. I'm gonna narrow my focus, I'm gonna call one individual. And I'm going to deal now with one nation. And this is key for the rest of the Bible. Or actually, the rest of the Old Testament. True. So God's going to narrow down his plan with the nation of Israel, eventually the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's going to deal with one man now and his descendants uh, in the rest of the Old Testament. So it's very, very crucial we understand this. So he's narrowing down his program. So he leaves Ur. He goes up here to Haran. And then he eventually heads down here. Now, eventually he goes down to Egypt in unbelief. We'll see that later. He flees down there, uh, but he goes back to the promised land. All right. Let's go back here then to our text in 
uh, Genesis 12. Now here we have what is called the Abrahamic Covenant. We've already dealt with that. Uh, we're going to just review a little bit on the Abrahamic Covenant, but we looked through the book of Genesis and we saw how the Abrahamic Covenant was given to Abram and eventually Isaac and Jacob was repeated. And then there's a mention here at the end of the book about Joseph, understanding that God will eventually bring him back and his bones will be returned to that promised land based on the Abrahamic Covenant. That's how the book of Genesis ends and it sets us up for the exodus from Egypt. But this key covenant is mentioned here in verse one. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country. Notice the word had said. I just want to put a had said to Abram. Now there's some translations that don't translate it that way. And the reason why the New King James states that is this is not simply the initial time he said when he was in Haran to go to the land of Israel, although this may have been repeated, but prior to that, when he was in Ur, we study Hebrews 11, we know that Abraham left Ur by faith. So prior to that, God gave this covenant. So I think uh, the understanding here is that initially God told him to leave Ur. He may have repeated that, obviously, when he was in Haran. Some scholars believe that he repeated this promise twice. But he said, at least the New King James has this translated, the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. And so we have the promises related to uh, Abram, including the Davidic covenant promise coming out of that. Actually, we have the uh, what we call, the, unfortunately, the Palestinian covenant, the land covenant. We have the, the Davidic covenant, and we have the new covenant that is in seed form, in the Abrahamic covenant. I don't have time to deal with that this morning, but those future covenants are based on this Abrahamic covenant. Keep, keep three terms in mind when you think about the Abrahamic covenant. Three terms, land, land, seed, and blessing. Okay, land, seed, and blessing. So I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, make your name great, Abraham's name is still great to this day. There's multiple religions, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, uh, uh, all recognize Abraham was a great individual. So he says, uh, make, I will make your name great. Abraham was great personally in his life as well. I will bless those who bless you. Notice that. And I will curse those who curse, curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So this blessing, I will bless them and bless you. Future descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If there are other nations that oppose or anti-Semitic, uh, God will judge those nations. And you can trace the history even after uh, in the days of the um, last few hundred years, you can trace nations that uh, mistreated the Jews and how they were judged. And I recommend a couple books on that line if you want to read about the history of anti-Semitism. There's a book by Colonel Thien called Anti-Semitism, which traces a history of the persecution of the Jews. Uh, and also, we have one written by Hal Winsley, the one who wrote The Great Late Great Planet Earth, he had an excellent book called The Road to Holocaust. It's probably an easier read than the other, the one by theme, but The Road to Holocaust, fascinating book. I think probably his best book um, uh, that he wrote. So we could trace that history. You know, we think about Spain, uh, the Inquisition, and how they were judged. Uh, we think about Great Britain, uh, uh, and we think about other nations that uh, went against the nation of Israel. And I, could, I would also add this, our own country, as we currently speak. God cannot prosper and bless this nation as long as we turn against the nation of Israel. We will not be blessed. This promise continues to this day. It hasn't been rendered invalid. Now, verse 3 says, And you, all the families of the earth, will be blessed. Think about that. And that is through the seed of Abram, which eventually will be the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who would die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. And when we believe in him, we are blessed. And the Bible says we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 3. We're spiritually blessed. So Christ Jesus' death on the cross is ultimately alluded to here through that final promise. We know that because Paul repeats that in Galatians. He mentions the gospel. The gospel is preached to Abram. And he mentions that phrase. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I think that's in Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 8. We'll just look at that just briefly. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abram. Where did he do that? In this phrase, beforehand saying, and you all the nations shall be blessed. See? And Christ was, in Galatians 3.16, that promised seed. And so if you believe in the coming seed, the coming Messiah, then you are blessed. Now, Let's also look at then that I have, I uh, think, um, I don't know if you can see that back there, but uh, basically the Abrahamic covenant deals with personal promises. I will bless thee. I'm using the old King James there. Bless you. Uh, Genesis 12, 2. I will make thy name great. Genesis 12, 2. In verse 3, uh, I will bless them, I bless thee, and curse them, and curse thee. So it's personal promises. That was true personally in Abram's life and also his descendants. Remember Balaam. Remember the story of Balaam later in Israel's history? What did Balaam try to do? Curse God's people. Uh, Balak paid off Balaam, probably in the uh, area of several million dollars, to curse Israel. I'll pay you this large sum. All you need to do is curse Israel. Right? Easy job, right? Just curse Israel. He goes to curse, and then a blessing comes out. <laughs> How am I going to curse God's people whom uh, I have blessed? And there's three or four different attempts. Balaam tried to curse Israel, but a blessing came out. <laughs> uh, that's an example of how this plays out, by the way, later in the book of Numbers. So we had the story of Balaam. Uh, and, because some Bible scholars would, would say this, well, this doesn't include the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It only includes Jesus. So if we personally curse Jesus, we're cursed. If we personally bless Jesus, we're blessed, and that's it. Wrong. Because we have an example of Balaam. So he's talking about the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jews. We don't limit it to Jesus. Certainly that's true of Jesus, but we certainly don't limit it to Jesus. This is personal, Abraham personally, and also the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, national promises, I will make of you a great nation. And this is true. Certainly under the United Kingdom, uh, Solomon was great. We had the Queen of Sheba, who came from the south, was amazed about Solomon's wisdom and wealth and influence. Uh, the nation of Israel grew to great prominence and, uh, out from the seed of Abram. And unto thy seed I will give this land. That land promise still is in effect today. The land doesn't belong to the Palestinians. The land belongs to the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there are specific boundaries given. And the nation of Israel does not, uh, does not own all that land today. But it belongs to them. It belongs to them. And this faulty idea of land for peace, land for peace, ridiculous. And when you look at the tiny portion of the land of Israel compared to all the nations surrounding Israel, Saudi Arabia and all that, it is minute. And you're going to give it further land and peace, land for peace, and it never happens because the heart's desperately wicked. See? Um, then the universal promises, and you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's through Christ's death on the cross. He would provide blessings for all mankind. And then I will bless them and bless thee and curse them and curse thee. So this is the basis of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, again, we've already traced this in the past the, through the book of Genesis, but I just have the verses there of how this covenant is repeated several times in the book of Genesis to Abraham. And Genesis chapter 12, 13, and 15, 17, and 22. This Abrahamic covenant is repeated 
uh, to Abraham. It's repeated to Isaac, uh, in Genesis 17, 26, chapter 26. Jacob in chapter 28, uh, in 35, and mentioned there in 48, verse 4. And then finally, Joseph at the end of the book of Genesis, Genesis 50, verse 24 through 26. Now, a little view of the land of Israel, the promise from the Wadi of Egypt, which is the southern boundary here. We call this the Brook of Egypt. That's not the Nile River, God promised. Uh, that's not Egypt. That doesn't belong to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Sinai Peninsula does not belong to them. Uh, this is the area where Kadesh Barnea was, where the spies were sent over down here uh, in this region, so far south of the Dead Sea region. And then all the way further, way up further north in the area of modern-day Syria, I have here a map of modern-day Syria. Some of that land belongs to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some of that land in which Syria occupies today belongs to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, including, by the way, the Golan Heights. Notice right here. On the other side of the Sea of Galilee, original promises made to the land of Israel. The tribe of Ephraim one day will inherit that region. And uh, Wednesday night, we looked at uh, Genesis chapter 47, which is basically this land divided in the millennial kingdom. And uh, this is the fulfillment. Ultimately, why do I believe in a future kingdom? I believe in a future kingdom for Israel. We call that premillennial theology. Uh, Christ is coming before the kingdom is established. He is the one that will establish a kingdom. The church is, we're not in the kingdom. I don't know how many times I have to repeat that, but it's so important. I don't care how many times you sing about kingdom blessings and kingdom this and kingdom that. We're not in the kingdom. Christ is not ruling in Jerusalem right now. See? David's not ruling as co-region on the throne. Of, a throne you know? There's not perfect peace among nations today. How can we be in the kingdom? Well, the kingdom's in your heart. Okay, all right. Christ may be in your heart, but certainly the kingdom's not in your heart. See? This idea of you're in the kingdom. Uh, that's faulty theology. Uh, and that ignores the future for Israel, by the way. That theology ignores the church has replaced Israel. Basically, uh, Israel, God judge Israel, they're done with, now the church is Israel. The Bible never calls the church Israel, ever, 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 ever. I know the two or three verses that covenant theologians try to use to try to support the church of Israel, they do not, those verses, one in Romans, that does not support that truth. The Israel God, by the way, which is referring to spiritual Jews. Okay, now, let's take a look back then in Genesis 12. We want to continue here. Now, Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So eventually, he left that region, verse 4. And uh, notice here, he heads eventually to the promised land. And the Lord, uh, he came into the land of Canaan, verse 5. And he passed through the land to the place of Shechem. And notice the Canaanites, that little, just little phrase, the Canaanites were then in the land. Anticipates later on the uh, account of the book of uh, Joshua, when Joshua would drive out those Canaanites later. But God would not do that in Abram's lifetime. God would not drive out those enemies in Abram's lifetime. He's waiting to do that under Joshua. He, later on it says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. They're not ready to be judged yet which is interesting. There's going to be a delay of 400 years plus before I will send Joshua in and conquer the land. But unfortunately, Joshua didn't do a complete job. I mean, uh, the children of Israel still kept portions of that land that were, they did not completely annihilate the Canaanites. But notice here the promise in verse 7, to your descendants I will give this land. Your descendants, I will give this land. The land he's standing on. He's not talking about heaven. A geographical territory he's standing on. This region here. I'm going to give to your descendants this land. Now, he continued on toward the south. He should have stopped there <laughs> uh, in the land of Israel, but there was a famine. So circumstances drove him out of the promised land. 
I think God was kind of, God's teaching a lesson here because the Exodus generation, Moses wrote, by the way, the five books of the Bible. Moses wrote Genesis. And so understanding that, the children of Israel would relate very well to how Abram goes down to Egypt and bad things happen there. <laughs> they would be reading this account saying, oh, Abram, man. You know, the other, we were slaves in Egypt. It, it ended up well at the end of the book for a little while, but there arose another Pharaoh that didn't know the descendants of uh, Abram. And therefore, Abram went down to Egypt because of a severe famine in the land. Remember later under Joseph, remember how the famine, and they went to Egypt again. This is repeated, by the way, in the story of Joseph. Uh, and uh, therefore, we have some similarities there. Now, Sarah was a very beautiful woman. And notice this uh, phrase here. I know you're a woman of beautiful countenance. Have you said that to your wife later, lately, husbands? You're a woman of beautiful countenance. Uh, so she's very good looking. And she knows that there would be trouble. Abram, knowing that, why did he put her in this position? I think sometimes guys are stupid. Uh, therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will let you live. Why don't you just tell them you're, you're my sister? Oh, that, we'll see how that goes. Uh, you're a si now, that's a half truth. That's a half lie. It's not completely true, you know. Uh, and so the Egyptians obviously recognized the fact that she was very beautiful, verse 14. And then they wanted to take her. And therefore the Lord, though, stopped before that happened, verse 17. The Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues. Now think about that. Where does that occur later on in Exodus? Think about that. So again, the children of Israel reading this saying, wow, you know, eh. God's going to plague, God plagued the Egyptians in the past. And, you know, so here we have uh, plague sent upon the house of Pharaoh because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And then, you know, he complains. Pharaoh said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's your sister? You know, and then uh, Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. They sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Now, that little story, I think, tells us that Egypt is outside the promised land. And uh, there's not a lot of good things that can happen there because you're outside of God's will, Abram, for the time being. And I think that's why this account is in the book of Genesis. Uh, that's not part of the promised land. Now, Abraham finally leaves Egypt, chapter 13, and him Lot, he, with Lot, and he heads to the south. Now, this is the south of the land of Israel. Now, he's going north, Obviously, he's going actually up into the land of Israel, but we call the Negev region it is an arid region in south in Israel. And I, I might have a map on that. Ne we'll call the Negev region in uh, southern Israel. Um, let's see if I have that maybe. Uh, this map shows, uh, I'll show you approximately this, re this region down here south of the Dead Sea, basically. Uh, he is headed toward the Negev region, going back up into the land of Israel. Abraham is very wealthy at this point. Notice Abrahamic covenant. I'm going to bless you. See? He's now a wealthy individual. This, so this shows you, uh, Abraham, why does it say he was very rich? Well, it shows him he's being blessed because of the Abrahamic covenant, because of God's promises. Verse 2, Abraham was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. And he went up to Bethel, uh, where, he, uh, where he journeyed at the beginning, actually between Bethel and Ai. And um, now, I, I do have a map on that region. And let me, let me, oh, just give me a minute here. And uh, we'll look at that Bethel Ai region here. Uh, let's see if I can pull this up here. If not, we'll continue on here. And... I think it's this one right here. And 
Yeah, this is his journeys here. No, I don't have the Beth map of Bethel region. We'll move on. We'll move on. But uh, here, uh, Abram goes to the area of Bethel, and God is um, something happens here between. I think this is the account where Lot and Abram separate. So basically. There's a multitude of flocks, and they're mixing together, and there's, you know, they're, they're a lot between Lot's herd and Abram's herd, and he says, you know what, you know, there's fights going on because of this, so I'll tell you what, you choose a place where you can take your herds and flocks and go, and I'll take whatever's left over, and that was a walk by faith, by the way. He gave Lot the choice. Okay, let's separate, uh, and... Notice verse 9, he says, it's not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. If you go to the right, then I will go to the left. This is Abram's trust in God. He's relaxed. He's relaxed in God's provision. He's not upset. He want, doesn't want to choose the best land. Uh, you go ahead, Lot. He realizes God's going to bless him anyway because of the Abrahamic covenant. You ever think about that? Um, what did Lot do? Lot, notice how it describes Lot. Lot lifted his eyes and saw. Now, remember going back to Genesis when the woman saw that the tree was good for food? See, that language here is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. Remember part of the world system, pride of life. She saw all the plain of Jordan. He saw, Lot did, the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered. Wow, that's a great land down there. And by we look, we would look around the Dead Sea today and say, "Wow, this is desolate." But in that time, it was well watered. Interestingly, the the uh, difference in in um, that day and our day today. But this is before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Notice it was like the Garden of the Lord. It's almost like the Garden of Eden. How well fertile it was, fertile land. He looked down. Wow, that's a lush land. I'm going to head down there. Now. Uh, Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. And Abram dwelt where? This is key. He dwelt in the land of Canaan. Why? Because that's the land that God promised him. He already made the earlier mistake of going to Egypt. See? So this time, Abraham is smart. He says, okay, you go down there. And, and by the way, Lot looked outside of the promised land. When we look at the location of Lot, or, or Sodom and Gomorrah, it's on the other side of the Dead Sea, actually the southern region of the Dead Sea. It's outside the Promised Land, and therefore uh, Lot, no, Lot is now headed toward Sin City. <laughs> Even today it's well known, the, the term Sodom is well known for a wicked city. Um, so Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And then the Lord said, after Lot separated himself, look now, lift your eyes now, look toward the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Notice God reaffirms his promises after Lot leaves. After Lot leaves, the Lord says, you know what? I'm going to remind you, I'm going to give this land to you. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. Think about that permanent promise. Notice it's not, this promise continues to this day, forever. It's a permanent promise. And I'm going to multiply your descendants as the dust of the earth. That was part of the original Abrahamic covenant. Um, Arise, walk in the land through its length, its width. I will give it to you. And Abraham moved his tent, went there, and dwelt by the terebinth tree of Mamre, which are in Hebron, another name for Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Now, we have a coalition of enemies that invade uh, the area, the region of Sodom. Think about this. Uh, Lot runs into trouble right off the bat. Uh, Lot going down to that wicked city, moving down in that area, knowing he knew very well the nature of that city. Don't think that Lot was naive and uh, didn't know. I think he clearly knew uh, the reputation of that town. And he headed there anyway. And now we have trouble once again. He's outside God's will. And we have these kings that come down 
and attack a series of nations going down. We have four kings against five kings, four against five. And basically, this coalition, and I do have a map here, are these, are these um, kingdoms over in the area of beginning Babylon, by the way, Shinar, Shinar, Elam. We have Goyim, which is translated uh, a title king of nations. The word nations could mean land or this area of Goyim. Uh, we, so we have this coalition right here of these four nation states. They go down and all the way down to this region and attack a series of tribal groups on along their way. So we'll take a look at the map here. And I don't know if you can see this in your text here. Um, and I can send you this map if you're interested, but uh, I think it's the Carta Bible Atlas. But basically here, we have this coalition of nations that head down and attack the Rephaim, Rephaim people group. Ashtaroth is mentioned there in Genesis 14. Ham is mentioned there. <coughs> Zuzim, the people there, tribal groups. And Iman, and they continue down the other side of the Sea of Gal or Sea of uh, Dead Sea region. They attack the Horites. Mount Seir is mentioned there in the text, and go down all the way to um, the southern region here, and then head back north, actually northwest, and eventually end up in this region south of the Dead Sea region. Okay. Now, the coalitions of city-states that are attacking them uh, are the five cities of the plain. Now, keep in mind, God not only judged Sodom and Gomorrah, we ignore the fact that God judged those five cities. There's a coalition of five cities that God judged. Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela. Those five city-states, uh, those are the uh, coalition of states around the sea, uh, region of the Dead Sea. Now, what does Abraham do? His nephew's in trouble. Eventually they come, they take them away, they take their goods and take them into captivity and they head north. And so they continue north and I'm trying to summarize this for you. Um, I think the next map here, I might have a, this, this map here. And let me zoom in on this map. This region. So this is the area of battle where they take Lot uh, and his family into captivity and then they head north and they take him several hundred miles all the way north and then eventually in the region of Dan. And so Abram finally has a coalition of over 300 men, an army, and he goes heads after him. So Abraham is headed north. He's finally he's going to rescue uh, Lot and his family and catches up to him, defeats the kings, defeats the kings. He comes back to the land and meets an interesting guy, Melchizedek, king of Salem or Jerusalem, which was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he paid a tithe to Melchizedek. The king of Sodom offers him a lot of the possessions taken in battle and he refuses he refuses to take the money off a godless king but he himself paid money to the king of Salem and the book of Hebrews later on mentions this is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ our great high priest so again God's really dealing with Abram and he sees his blessing he refuses to take money off of and, and pay, uh, godless pagans but he does pay money to the king of Salem. So we'll look at that next time we're together. Just read Genesis chapter 14 uh, and 15, and we'll, we'll look at that next time. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the account of Genesis, and we look at the life of Abram, how he was a man, not perfect, but a man who did walk by faith. And certainly we need to imitate the faith of Abraham, Father. We know that the just shall live by faith, and there are various tests that come in our life, tests that may distract us from your truth. Uh, help us to recognize those things, Lord, and realign our focus upon you and your word. And we ask these things in Christ's name.
Amen.